Welcome to the Legal Aspects of Missouri Custody Laws. Hi, I'm Jeannie Gordon. I'm the Legal Issues Training Coordinator for the Children's Division. Um, we're here today to talk about the Legal Aspects DVD series and we're going to talk about the laws on custody. These materials are available on the Children's Division Internet. Uh, you go to Practice and Professional Development and look for the Legal Aspects DVD series. Today is January 30th, 2012. So to begin this training, there's 100,000 hotline calls that the, that the Children's Division gets a year, and at least 50,000 or more are CAN investigations or assessments. What kind of families do we deal with? We deal with one-parent families, we deal with two-parent families, we deal with kids that are placed with relatives, we deal with kids that are placed with custodians that they aren't even related to. Um, sometimes we know who dad and his family are and sometimes we don't and, or the parent's not going to disclose that information. Many of the calls revolve around high conflict custody cases between mom and dad. Some of these cases have custody orders in place. We also deal with domestic violence cases. Uh, many of those, if they have child orders of protection and adult orders of protection, may have child custody orders too. The purpose of the training is to make you aware that there may be legal issues involving custody that may affect your ability to do safety planning, um, ability to assess safety and risk, and then to provide services to the family. On the second slide, we have an index of topics. That's set up for your convenience so you can easily access uh, the, on the PowerPoint where that information is if there's a specific topic that you're looking for. The goals of the training, we would like for you to be able to understand uh, a basic understanding of the laws on custody and parenting plans, of orders of protection in DV cases, of adult and minor guardianships, and of that document called a power of attorney. Uh, also, we want you to be able to apply these concepts to your work. The limitation on the training is just to remind you these are to help you with your work. They're not meant for you to use to give legal advice to the clients that we serve. So as we go through the training, if you'll notice there are blue boxes to the side. If there's an important statute number, that statute number will be listed in that box. Another reminder is that these laws apply in the real world. If juvenile court becomes involved, then juvenile court orders will trump these orders until jurisdiction is terminated. So let's start with child custody and divorce cases. That's our first section. Um, what happens when the parents get divorced? What, what does the law say about what custody looks like? First of all, uh, what are the types of custody? There's joint legal custody or sole legal custody, meaning both parents have, make the legal decisions together or only one makes it. Then there's joint physical custody or sole physical custody, meaning both parents have physical custody of the child or only one parent has physical custody of the child. And the court can make any determination thereof, any combination thereof. As a general rule, if the parents are playing nice in the sandbox, then you're going to end up with a joint custody uh, in terms of joint legal and physical custody of the children. If for some reason there's concerns that a parent is harmful to the child and the court makes that kind of finding, you may see a type of custody where um, there's only one parent has physical custody and there may be either limitations on visitation that require it to be supervised or the court may have denied that parent visitation altogether. So you have to know what's in these orders and if you get the chance ask the parent to show you, them to you. Um, the one caution on these terms is that for, before 1998 there was a term used called primary physical custody. So if the kids are 14 or older, there may be custody orders out there that use the term primary f uh, physical custody. Um, you're going to have to read the orders or ask the parent to explain exactly what that means to kind of understand what the custody is. But the S Missouri Supreme Court says you have to use the terms, in the custody orders, they should use the terms joint or sole legal and physical custody, and those are the terms that should be used. Um, besides the terms joint and legal, uh, legal and physical custody, there's also a term called primary residence. That means if, if the parents have joint physical custody, and if you think about it, this makes a whole lot of sense. That means they may be going to school from one home or the other, or both, depending upon if 
one of the parents has custody during the week. So rather than the school have to send things out to both parents, they only have to send it to one, and that's the person that's, that's designated as the primary uh, residence for purposes, for these educational purposes. So if that, if that term shows up, be sure and, and realize that only has to do with getting the information from the schools about the child. So who gets custody in a, when mom and dad are getting a divorce? Well, it turns out it's not just mom and dad. It could be mom, it could be dad, and it could be a third party. So think about it, sometimes when mom and dad are getting a divorce, there's a family member that comes forth and says, really neither one of these parents are fit to have custody, and I think I am. And there may be cases where the court makes the type of finding where they end up giving custody to that third party custodian. It's usually gonna be a grandparent or another relative. Um, one of the things that comes up in training a whole lot is, shouldn't that be a guardianship? When we're talking about third party custody? Well, honestly, it looks like a whole lot like a guardianship, but it's just the opportunity that there's an open divorce and this grandparent or other relative can step into the case and get custody of the child without opening a brand new case called a guardianship. So um, if there's not a pending action going on between mom and dad over custody, that's where you're gonna see the relatives just go out and file a guardianship, and that's the more normal way to do it. But once in a while, you'll run, you'll run across these third-party custodians. So we're gonna mention it a little bit as we go. So let's start with custody between mom and dad. Well, the court wants to see joint and physical and joint legal custody. That's the preference for the court. The next preference down would be joint physical with one parent granted sole legal custody. The next step down would be joint legal with only one parent granted a sole physical custody. The next step down is sole legal and physical granted to one parent. So the other parent isn't gonna have any at all. And then the last choice, the bottom choice, is that third party custodian. So that's, that's the way it works. So we're gonna start with what the terms mean and then put it all together. So what does joint legal custody mean? It means the parents share the decision-making rights, responsibility, and authority related to the health, education, and welfare of the child. That works well as long as the parents are playing nice in the sandbox with each other. Um, but there's a, the courts have an out where they can say, unless allocated, apportioned, or decreed. So maybe most of the time, the parents show, uh, share joint legal uh, custody and share all the decision-making. But for example, maybe mom is the only one that makes medical decisions. So that may not apply um, while we're looking at the cases, but it's important to ask these questions on who has legal custody and why uh, when we're working at, with the families at the various points of service that we do. So what's joint, cust joint physical custody mean? It means that the order awards each parent significant but not necessarily equal periods of time. So is there any examples of that? Well, I think the best example you can use is one parent uh, may get physical custody every other weekend, every Wednesday night, and a month in the summer. And that's considered enough for it to be joint physical custody. So it doesn't have to necessarily be equal, it should, but they're considered to share joint physical custody. So be really careful when you're talking to a parent, and again, uh, when you look at our clients, sometimes these terms may be, may be um, beyond them or not exactly what they understand. So sometimes you may have to ask them if you can look at a copy of their di uh, divorce decree and parenting plan. So we've talked about joint legal and joint physical and what that looks like with mom and dad. So what does third party custody mean? Uh, third party is designated by the court as the legal and physical custodian. It requires that each parent be found to be unfit or unsuitable or unable to be a custodian or the welfare of the child requires it and that it's in the child's best interest. So let's take an, uh, uh, an example. Let's say the parents are separated and going through a divorce. Mom is a drug addict and leaves the child with a maternal grandmother weeks on end. Dad lives with his parents, has two D DWIs, and can no longer drive. The maternal grandmother intervenes in their open divorce case and asks the court for custody. 
that would be one of those cases where you can clearly show that each parent is unfit, unsuitable, or unable to be a custodian of the child. How does that look in terms of comparison to a guardianship? Well, maybe mom and dad are married but not living together. Maybe mom cannot care for the child as a result of a head injury in a car accident. Dad has severe drug issues and can't care for the child. Grandmother could step in and file a guardianship. The difference is there's no pending divorce or custody case that's ongoing. And that's the difference between a guardianship and um, a third-party custodian. Again, if you're looking at, at bringing a child into care from a third-party custodian, you would also want to put in your affidavit uh, to the court for removal that, um, that this person is a third-party custodian, meaning that the court has found that each parent is unfit, unsuitable, or unable to be a custodian. The court needs to know that. Uh, that will help you, I think, in terms of, of removal issues. Not only does the third party custodian get to have custody when the parents are unfit or unsuitable, but also the court has to make a finding that this third party is suitable. So if a relative comes forward that isn't suitable, they're not going to be allowed to become the third party custodian. Um, and when the court does grant some type of custody to a third party custodian, it can be custody, it can be temporary custody, or it can be visitation. We're going to take a look now at, at a law that also applies in juvenile cases. So if, if you do AC work, you might be familiar with it. This law exists in custody cases just like it does in juvenile cases. It's called the Prohibition on Parental Custody and Unsupervised Vis Visitation. So in any court proceeding related to custody of a child, the court cannot grant custody to a parent who has a Missouri felony sex conviction or another person living in the parent's home who has that Missouri felony sex conviction where a child was a victim. It's a complicated law. Like I said, it, mir it mirrors section 210.117 and 211.038 uh, under the child welfare stuff. <clears throat> and it, but it prohibits reunification or placement for the same reasons. So dad or someone living in the home has the, the Missouri felony sex conviction against the child. And there are specific criminal um, listed in the statute that you'd have to look up to make sure. And this should be in children's division policy. There's no mandatory prohibition if it's an out-of-state conviction. So if dad's conviction for a felony sex offense against a child was in Illinois or elsewhere, the court doesn't necessarily have to say, no, no, the child can't be placed with that parent or when that other person's in the home. But I think what you need to do is use your common sense and, and uh, you would recognize that the courts are generally not going to place with a child that has those kind of convictions. They're more likely to uh, deny legal and physical custody and allow the parent supervised visitation, if any visitation at all. And that's generally what you would see in these custody cases. Parental visitation orders. Okay, sometimes these, uh, the courts are going to grant um, legal and physical custody to only one parent. And then that other parent, uh, can they have visitation or not? And the court has to make that decision. So the court can allow visitation, the court can provide for supervised visitation, or the court can deny visitation altogether. An example of supervised visits in these type of cases would look like Mom has drug and alcohol problems and has lost her driver's license, meaning she shouldn't be transporting the child. She does not have custody, legal or physical, the, the father does, but the child spends every Wednesday at maternal grandmother's house where mother is allowed to visit as long as grandma is present in the house. Mother goes home and then grandmother keeps the child overnight and takes the child to school. That's a very common type of practice. Uh, when one parent for some reason or another is denied physical custody but is allowed supervised visits. The courts have to be very specific on the visits. Let's look at slide 19. If the court denies visits or requires uh, visits to be supervised, there's going to be this court finding that visitation would in, in um, danger the child's physical health or impair his or her emotional development. 
Again, I think this is pretty important to know because again, you can use this in a PC affidavit if you're removing from the other parent and this one um, has been denied visitation or only has supervised visitation, then you can tell the court that there had to have been this finding in the, in the court order. Um, these are good things to find out when you're working an F FCS case or an IIS case, which I guess is contractors now, and providing services. Um, so you're going to want to ask to see if that finding is in the, the custody order between the parents, and you're looking for the facts that would have required a judge to make that kind of finding, if at all possible. I think slide 20 and 21, probably 22, are the most important slides of this whole, of this whole presentation because we're going to talk about parenting plans. So mom and dad get divorced, and the, the parenting plan is actually a court order. At the very end of it, it says court ordered. That means it works just like any other kind of judgment, and we cannot tell parents that they don't have to abide by the, by the judgment. We can't tell them to break that. So court orders and parenting plans include custody. They include visitation, and they include residential time. And by residential time, we're not talking about placement in a residential facility. We're talking about placement in the residence of one parent or the other. So the judge signs the parenting plan at the end of it. Um, they, these parenting plans have been in effect since at least 1998. So they should be there in most of the custody cases that you would be looking at. Why can we not tell parents to violate these plans? Number one, because it's a court order. And we can't tell people to violate court orders. Number two, there are court sanctions for that parent if they violate the order. If they violate custody, if they violate visitation, if they violate other terms of the parenting plan, and that, that includes contempt proceedings against them. So if, um, sometimes in the FCS cases, I think that the, our clients talk to the workers and want help uh, from the worker to help with the other parent who's violating their parenting plan. I think all we can do in those cases is suggest they go get an attorney. Slide 22 is the big, big one, guys. Why emphasize that parenting plans are court orders? Because we have no legal authority to require a parent to violate their court-ordered parenting plan. So again, make sure you ask if there are custody orders in place uh, from a divorce, from a paternity case, in an, in an existing child order of protection in DV cases, and make sure you understand what the court has ordered. So what are the parenting plan? plan issues across child welfare. I think this is important for our workers as well as our, our contractors who do the IAS to understand. In all points of service, when we work with a family prior to removal, you want to be asking about information about mom and dad. From a social work perspective, you're wanting to find out how they function as a family. And from a legal uh, perspective, you want to know if there's any existing custody orders. So the kinds of questions, were they married? Uh, did they get divorced? If so, was there a parenting plan? Who got legal custody? Who got physical custody? Ask them to spell out who has custody when. And if there's a parent who has no physical custody and no right to visits or supervised visits, what did the court say was the reason? There should be some sort of finding behind that order. Um, at removal, this information is important. Uh, in case one of the parents is not entitled to physical custody and has been denied visitation by the court or may only have supervised visits. Again, you want to put that in your PC request. Uh, a lot of times what comes up in cases at removal is that we've, we've got a parent that's, that's not the one causing the problem. They're not the offending parent. You've got the parent that we're investigating for abuse or neglect and then you've got this other parent who hasn't done anything wrong. But there are custody orders that says this parent has the child for this period of time and this parent has the child for this period of time. The, that parent cannot violate the custody order even though the parent's being harmful to the child. So I think you put that in the affidavit that there is this legal impediment. There is this, the, because of the court order and the requirement that dad turn the child over to mom, on X date, dad can't protect the child. And I don't think that's a finding against the dad 
when all it deals with is there's a, there's a legal custody reason. There's a custody order that prevents him from protecting the child from the mother. And I think that's probably the best way to say it. There's a, there's a custody order out there that prevents the dad from um, protecting the child from the mom. That's a very nice way to phrase it. And then provide the information. So we're talking across the spectrum. Let's look for permanency. It's important for permanency uh, if there are any existing custody orders when the child's removed. Because again, if, if we, um, both parents have been bad parents and one parent has gotten their act together, but the other uh, parent still remains potentially harmful to the child, say they had joint legal and physical custody, well then that, that dad's going to have to go back to court and get their custody arrangement modified so that he has sole physical custody and can protect the child from mom and we won't be able to terminate jurisdiction until that's done. So that's something to think about all the way through the case. The example I've got is mom and dad have joint legal and physical custody in the parenting plan. Dad's not been seeing the kids at all for a couple of years. Mom physically abuses the children and then they're placed in protective custody. The permanency plan is reunification. Dad gets his act together quickly and the kids are placed with him. Mom refuses any treatment for meth use, anger management, and parenting classes and continues to deny that she physically abused the children. Dad will need to modify custody before the juvenile court can terminate jurisdiction. Let's talk about uh, a different subject. So now we're going to talk about the case where mom and dad aren't married, but they need some custody orders in place. Uh, sometimes when mom and dad are not married and they aren't playing nice in th the sandbox, mom's going to file a paternity action, action so she can get dad to pay support. Um, and sometimes dad files the action because he or he and his family, especially if he's a younger man, um, would like access to the child and what, would like him declared the father so they can have a relationship with that particular child. And sometimes these cases are filed just to straighten out who's dad when there's more than one possibility. Maybe mom has been married to one man, but she's saying someone else is the biological father of the child, and they're, they're contesting it. So that's the purpose of the actions, is really to declare who's dead. But as a result of that, in these paternity cases, uh, they can ask for custody as well as vis visitation. So we need to know that, so that if there's a paternity action done and mom and dad were never married, you still wanna know if possibly there's custody orders that exist between the two of them. So how does it work? We're on slide 26. One court determines, uh, once court determines paternity, then either parent can say, we wanna submit a parenting plan and we want custody ordered by the court. Well, the court can do that then. And what they're going to look, do is they're going to look to the divorce statutes on how you do custody. You know, the joint legal and physical custody um, or, or the different variations of those. That's what they're going to look at when they decide custody between the parents in a paternity action. So there can be parenting plans when the parents were married and there can be parenting plans when they're not. So again, very important questions to ask um, as you provide services at any point in the case to a family. Let's switch subjects to child custody in orders of protection cases. Um, why do we want to talk about these domestic violence cases? Well, number one, I think it's important for safety planning. Number two, there's important factual information in the petition that the parent, if it's the parent that's filing a child order of protection, that they're putting in there about how the other parent has been a bad parent to the child. And that's important to know. Uh, that would be about abuse or, or stalking. Third, it goes to the parent's ability to protect the child. Uh, we know that in some of these domestic violence cases, uh, the parents make allegations of adult abuse or child, order, uh, child abuse, and, and then before that case goes through, they don't follow through with it and they end up dropping the case. And sometimes that could be uh, an issue of whether or not that parent can protect the child, and that comes into play in investigations and assessments. Uh, if possible, you want to get a copy of that court-ordered um, document that's got that verified information attached to it so you can see what it looks like. You may be able to get that to the parent that you're working with, um, and you may also be able to get it from the court. You'll have to check. 
So child, uh, orders of protections come in two varieties. They're either ex parte orders of protection or they're full orders of protection. And that applies wh whether you're dealing with an adult or whether you're dealing with a child. And in all of those instances, uh, they may inc include child custody. So you need to know to look for that in the order. So we're gonna start out with what's the difference between an ex parte and a full order of protection? Well, the ex parte order is the one that's uh, issued by the court before the respondent, meaning the domestic violence perp, has received notice of the petition and had an opportunity to be heard on it. Remember, that's that due process that every person gets in these kind of cases. Um, notice of what they've done wrong and opportunity to be heard. If the court's going to issue an ex parte court order, the factual information has to rise to the level that the court can make a finding of an immediate and present danger of abuse to the child. So there's got to be something factual in there that, come, that arises to that level. So full order. Well, the full order of protection is issued after the court has served summons on that DV perp, telling them how they've been a bad person to this child or to the other adult, and then where they've had a chance, uh, notice of the hearing, and a chance to tell their side of the story. That's where they've had their full due process. So that's how a full order is issued. I'd like to explain a little bit um, in more detail on the term ex parte. There are some people that think the term ex parte only applies in orders of protection, and that's not necessarily true. Um, the term ex parte just means that one side has access to the judge. So if you think about it, uh, when an action for an order of protection, say a child order of protection, is initiated, then that parent or legal guardian is going to go to the court, talk to the clerk, fill out all the paperwork about, and about how that other parent has been a bad parent to the child. And then they're going to verify to say it's true. The clerk's going to take that information to the judge. And the judge is going to make his or her decision just based on having looked at that one side of the story. That's why it's an ex parte order, because it's one side of the story. So sometimes you will see the term ex parte used in juvenile cases at the very beginning of the case when a child's coming into protective custody and the juvenile officer may take the information to the court and the court issues an ex parte order of protection or order to, to place the child in care. So that's the difference. Ex parte just means only one side has access to the judge when the judge is making their decision. So another reason why it's kind of uh, important to understand because I think our uh, FCS workers, maybe the IIS workers, sometimes end up in court on these on the hearings on these full order of protection. So what you want to remember is um, that the courts only that court only issued that order because there was some sort of immediate and present danger of abuse to the child, and you would probably have the facts that would go to that immediate and present danger of abuse. So what information did you have? when you assess safety issues and the need for services in the case and whether or not the uh, parent was cooperative or protecting the child. So all of that information is what the court's going to is going to be looking for and uh, why this needs to be continued. So how long are these orders of, a, of uh, protection in place? Whether it's an adult order or a child order of protection, the ex parte order is only a temporary order in place for a short period of time until that there can be a hearing on the issue. So that's generally 15 days or less, and during that time the sheriffs are scrambling to get that other parent in terms of child orders of protection. They're scrambling to get that parent served, and then they have the hearing. And it's usually done in 15 days or less, unless there's a good, good cause for a continuance. And so that happens once in a while. Once that, that full hearing has been held, then a full order of protection can be issued. And they're good from six months to a year. After that year period of time, they can be renewed. And there's actually a clause in there for auto renewal in some cases when the court makes some certain findings that are involved. But that's beyond the scope of this training. But just know that they are renewable. So let's talk a little bit more about the process. We're going to talk about who files for an adult order. We're going to talk about who files for a child order. We're going to talk about what does the court consider abuse and stalking to be? 
and you know what's this class of persons who could be the domestic violence perp that we're talking about the that's called the respondent in the case so who falls for an adult order well the adult victim can file the petition they have to be subject to the abuse by a present or former family or household member that's the terminology used for the for the type of domestic perp that they can get these orders against or um, the adult victim has to be been the victim of stalking. Who can file to protect the child? <clears throat> Interestingly enough, this plays into a lot of uh, the work we do in cases because it turns out it has to be a parent or a guardian of the victim, meaning a legal guardian of the victim. It has to be the guardian ad litem or a CASA representative or a juvenile officer. So just because the child is placed with grandma and grandpa who don't have legal custody, we can't suggest to grandma and grandpa that they go out up and get an order of protection against mom and dad because they're not the type of person who has the authority to file it. So let's review that again. It has to be a parent or the legal guardian of the child, a guardian ad litem or CASA, or a juvenile office, officer. Those are who can file. Who are the orders against? And again, the, I know this sounds like legal mumbo jumbo, but the term is it has to be a family or household member or the person stalking the child. And when I talk DV perp, that's who we're talking about in this particular case. Um, note one of the changes to the law is that the DV perp can be a minor. That means a child under 17. And uh, those kind of cases are gonna end up in juvenile court. That's part of the new laws. So when we talk about who are family and household members, we're on slide 34. Well, first of all, their spouses or former spouses. That makes sense. They're any person related by blood or marriage, okay? Relatives, that makes sense. Persons presently residing together or who have done so in the past. So that's the first slide. There's about eight of these, but we're gonna start with these. So think in terms of relatives. It's broad enough now that it could be an underage teenager beating up on their parent, or an underage teen beating up on a sibling or on a grandparent that lives in the home, or they don't even have to live in the home. All they have to be is related by blood or marriage. Okay, so that would include the in-law piece of it too. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, the term uh, former and family and household members has been expanded to include social relationships. So we're on slide 35. So actually what it's looking like is that we're talking about domestic violence, i.e. abuse or stalking, which could be between, say, a high school boyfriend and his girlfriend. The, it's any person who is or has been in a social relationship of a romantic or intimate nature with the victim. So again, think about it a little bit. It could be a boyfriend and girlfriend uh, it could be people who have never lived together but have had an intimate or social relationship of a romantic nature. And the last one is anyone who has a child in common, regardless of whether they have been married or have resided together at any time. So let's run, run back through the list again because there's five different types of people that fit family or household member. So they'd be spouses or former spouses, any person related by blood or marriage, meaning relatives, persons presently residing together or who have done so in the past, any person who or has been in a social relationship of a romantic or intimate nature with the victim, anyone who has a child in common regardless of whether they have been married or have resided together at any time. So that's, that's who, who they can be filed against. That's who you can get an order against. So it's, it's been broadened significantly to include a much bigger group of people. Please note that if you're in the middle of an investigation or um, a, an investigation call comes in and, and it's domestic violence, you need, you need to be aware that these situations are out there even though they would not meet care, custody, and control for purposes of our investigation in some respects. All right, so we've talked about who the DV perp can be and we've talked about they have to commit an act of domestic violence. So what do we mean by abuse and stalking? So that's where we're gonna start. Let's start with abuse. Abuse is defined as any of the following acts, attempts, or threats. 
So if you look at the list, it includes assault, battery, coercion, harassment, sexual assault, and unlawful imprisonment. And I think for purposes of this training, since a lot of times these contacts are going to be at investigations uh, or assessments um, or at intensive in-home services, we need to kind of know what those, um, those mean. And the best I can do is give you the definitions that come out of this section. So assault means that purposely or knowingly placing or attempting to place another in fear of physical harm. So consider that. It, it doesn't mean there has to be physical injury. If you purposely or knowingly place or attempt to place another in fear of physical harm, that's enough for, for assault. So it, again, on some of these issues, when we're doing an investigation, they may not always match up really well with what it takes for us to make a finding of uh, abuse by preponderance of the evidence. What does battery mean? Battery means purposely or knowingly causing physical harm to another with or without a deadly weapon. So you're causing physical harm to another with or without a deadly weapon. And these definitions apply to child as well as, well as an adult, if, if they're the victim. Coercion. Coercion is defined as compelling another by force or threat of force to engage in conduct from which the latter has a right to abstain or to abstain from conduct in which the person has a right to engage. So you're keeping them from doing something. Uh, you're coercing someone. Let's look at the definition of harassment. Harassment means engaging in a purposeful or knowing course of conduct involving more than one incident that alarms or causes distress to an adult or child and serves no legitimate purpose. The course of conduct must be such as would cause a reasonable adult or child to suffer substantial emotional distress and must actually cause substantial emotional distress to the petitioner or the child. So it's got a couple of examples that are included in this legal definition. Following another about in a public place or places, and secondly, peering in the windows or lingering outside the residence of another, but does not include constitutionally protected activity. Okay. If we go back to our list of abuse definitions, the next one is sexual assault. Sexual assault is defined as causing or attempting to cause another to engage involuntarily in a, any act of sex by force, threat of force, or duress. So let's say that again. Sexual assault, causing or attempting to cause another to engage in involuntarily in any sexual act by force, threat of force, or duress. The last one on the list is unlawful imprisonment. So what does unlawful imprisonment mean? It's the holding, confining, detaining, or abducting another person against that person's will. So that's what constitutes abuse uh, for the domestic violence statutes. And of course, there's a couple of exceptions, which look a lot like the exceptions we have uh, under the Chapter 210 definition of abuse. Except a child abuse does not include abuse that's inflicted accidentally or reasonably administered discipline, including spanking. So I thought that was kind of interesting to see that in that particular section. So what does stalking mean? That's when a person purposely and repeatedly engages in an unwanted course of conduct that causes reasonable fear of danger of physical harm to another person. Okay, we finish with acts of domestic violence in terms of abuse and stalking. Um, but let's talk about a couple of things that you cannot get child orders of protection for. Let's take a look at slide 40. This is when no child orders of protections can be issued by the court. The first instance, there cannot be a pending child custody hearing or prior child custody order. So the court has to actually make that finding. So if mom and dad uh, are getting a divorce and there is a hearing set on the case, and custody will be part of it, of course, then no child order protection can be issued. If mom and dad have already custody orders between them, 
then the parent is not going to be able to go to court and get a child order of protection. The second um, instance is things that comes up in our investigations quite regularly. We do investigations for abuse and neglect and we do safety planning around those issues. A, a lot of times uh, suggestions are made about the parents getting child orders of protection. Well, the problem is, is you cannot get a child order of protection for neglect. Remember, the statute says that child order of protections are issued because of domestic violence against the child. And that is defined as abuse or stalking. It does not say neglect. So in summary, the court has no jurisdiction to issue child orders of protection in these two instances. Well, let's take a look about child custody in the adult orders of protection. We're gonna look at them first, and then we're gonna look at the child custody orders and see how the court does custody first in the ex parte case and then in the full order of protection. So we're gonna start with ex parte orders in adult um, child orders of protection cases. So the parent gets an order, uh, ex parte order, that the other parent has to stay away from, from them. Well, they can also get a temporary order of custody of the minor children. They can also deny the, the DV perp, the respondent, entry to the home. So that's, that's what they can do on the ex parte piece. It uh, looks a little different when you get to the full order of protection in adult order cases. So in a full order, uh, the, the court is going to have to include custody and visitation in its orders. And when it makes that custody determination, it's going to look at a presumption of custody to the non-abusive parent unless the court makes some sort of finding that both parents were abusive to each other. So how's the court going to make their decision? They're, they're going to do what happens in the divorce cases. They're going to go and look at do we have joint legal and physical? Do we have sole legal and physical? Do we have some combination thereof? And would that be best for the child? Uh, the court also can look at visitation and whether or not that is in the child's best interest. So the court's going to assume in these uh, full orders of protection that the non-custodial parent has a right to visitation unless the court finds it would endanger the child's physical health or impair the child's emotional development, otherwise conflict with the child's best interest, or if it can't be arranged to protect the custodial parent from further abuse. Again, I think it's important for us to know this because if we're removing from the parent that's got custody, we want to be able to tell the court in the PC affidavit that uh, in the adult, full adult order of protection, there's an order that the child can uh, ha not have contact with the parent or the parent does not have custody based on it would have endangered the child's physical health or impaired the child's emotional development or whatever reason that the court made. So you will need that for safety planning. Um, child custody and child orders of protection. The Ex parte order may include a temporary order of custody of the minor children where appropriate and again may deny the respondent entry to the home under certain conditions. In this particular um, slide though, we're also talking about the full order, which may include custody and visitation. Um, again, you're going to have no pending or prior orders of custody between the parents in order to obtain a child order of protection. Um, and the initial ex parte case is going to have to have a finding of substantial danger uh, required for denying respondent entry into the home, just so that you're aware of that. There's one other quirky kind of order that's in the child order protections. It's 455.513.3, and it talks about children's division involvement in these DV cases when they're filed. The statute actually said, says for child orders of protections, if the allegations in the petition would give rise to jurisdiction under section 211.031, which is juvenile court jurisdiction, the court can direct CD to do an investigation and provide appropriate services, and that a written report may be due in 30 days. Um, just be aware of that exists out there. I think uh, all across the state, you guys know how to handle those. Let's move on to another section. Let's talk about adult and minor guardianships and what custody looks like in those cases. And again, I think this is important throughout the cases uh, at all points of service where we're providing uh, services, whether we're doing an investigation, an assessment, 
uh, any contact we have with the family. It's important to know this information. We're going to start with the difference between a guardianship and a conservatorship. A guardianship is about the legal decision making for the child. They're the legal and physical custodian of the child. Or it's about all the legal decision making um, for the adult person who can't make those decisions for themselves. But a conservatorship is only about money. Money, 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 money. I know I shouldn't quit my day job, but I had to sing it. Uh, conservatorship is really just about the managing the assets of the child or managing uh, the income and assets of the adult. So a person could actually have a, a conservatorship and still be able to care for their own child. That's possible. So it's very important that we understand the distinction between guardianships and conservatorships. So let's take a look at exactly what can a court do, uh, the probate court, uh, if we're talking about possible court actions. Well, they can determine a guardianship is needed. They can determine a limited guardianship is needed, meaning a, for some reason that adult does not need a full guardianship. They can determine that uh, a conservatorship is needed over a person's money, or they can determine that it's only needed over part of a person's money, and that's called a limited conservatorship. Um, and again, any combination of full or limited guardianship or conservatorship can be granted. So it's one of those mixed bags where you kind of put it all together and see where you end up. Um, what the terms the courts use when they have made that decision, it's called a letter of guardianship over the person, whether it's a minor child or an adult. And then for the conservatorship piece, they're called letters of conservatorship over the estate. Those are the technical terms that are used. So we're going to start um, with legal guardianship of a child. Let's start there. When does a court grant guardianship of a child? Well, first of all, if there's no living relative, and that makes sense. Consider that sometimes, say, there's a car accident and the child survives, but both parents die in the accident. Well, then a relative can step forward and apply to the probate court to be the guardian of the child. Um, the second way, the court uh, makes a finding that the parents are unwilling, unable, or judged unfit to parent the child. And that's one of those cases where, say, both parents are very young or both parents have disappeared and a grandparent or relative has been caring for the child for some period of time. They go to the probate court, file a petition that says, I want to be um, the guardian of the child, and both of these parents are unfit, unwilling, or able, and then gives a factual basis why. The third way, which is under the TPR judgment statute, is that when parents' rights have been terminated under Chapter 211, there's a possibility of doing a guardianship then. A lot of times we see permanency plan, once the kids are in care, we see permanency plans of guardianship when the child has come into protective custody. So <clears throat> it's important to know that, that it can be done outside of having a, a juvenile court case where the permanency plan is guardianship. It can be done up front. Uh, limited guardianship. Sometimes the court will appoint a legal guardian for a limited uh, purpose. Uh, one example that I can think of is um, in the case, because of some serious problems with medical decisions that were made, um, the father was unknown, there was no father in the case, uh, the, the mother agreed to a guardianship where the public administrator was appointed as the medical decision maker for the child. In all other respects, the child was safe at home with the mother, but that was one way of uh, doing a guardianship for a limited purpose. So you see those sometimes. Well, we've talked about getting a guardianship, either a full guardianship for a child or a limited one. So what are the effects on the parent's rights? Well, their rights have not been terminated, but they have no right to legal or physical custody of the child and no right to make decisions for the child unless the legal guardian lets them. Um, the parent still owes a duty to support the child. They can be subject to a child support enforcement order. They also still have a duty to maintain that parent-child relationship. But again, that's going to be based on uh, as allowed by the guardians. So something to think about, and you guys see this, um, the legal guardians can keep the child or place the child with whomever they want. So um, on the back end of cases where the child's been in protective custody and the permanency plan is guardianship, uh, we see 
you know, relatives step up to the plate and do guardianship. And it's either be, um, it either works or it doesn't. And when it works, then they're protecting the child from the parents and, and making good decisions on behalf of the child. But sometimes what we see is the family just wants the children's division out of their lives. And so they, a, a grandparent or someone will step up and do the guardianship. And then as soon as juvenile court jurisdiction is terminated, they will return the child to the parent. Um, and we know that's not a safe thing to do, and some of those kids end up coming back into care. Uh, so sometimes we see those FCS, IAS investigations where the legal guardians have given the, um, the child back to the parent. Uh, but sometimes, uh, we're going to talk about terminating a minor guardianship, but sometimes when the parents want to do that, there's a good reason for it. And, and I've got an example, and this is a case I actually sat through. So a young mother, uh, under, well, under age, she was about 18. Uh, her paramour broke the child's arm. She was kind of wild. The child comes into protective custody, and within a few months of being under juvenile court jurisdiction, the maternal um, grandparent did guardianship of that child. Fast forward four or five years later, and sitting in probate court, that grandfather gets up on the stand and says, Your Honor, I would like to terminate jurisdiction. My daughter is older now. She's more mature. Um, she has a good job, she can care for this child, and I don't any longer need to be the legal custodian of the child. And I thought that was a great thing. So sometimes it really does work. So there's a couple different ways when we're talking about uh, terminating a minor guardianship. In that particular case, clearly the court could find that the parent was fit to care for the child and it was in the child's best interest to terminate the guardianship and return the child to the mother. Um, Sometimes the court terminates jurisdiction because the child turns 18. So once the child turns 18, they're no longer a child, they're an adult, and therefore the probate court has no jurisdiction over that child. There are other reasons too that, that guardianships can terminate or dissolve is the term that can be used. Um, some of those include uh, there's no one to be the guardian and the court is under juvenile court jurisdiction. There's various reasons or we may have a guardian resign or the court feels it's in the best interest to terminate the guardianship. And again, those kids usually end up in juvenile court care. I want to take a minute to talk about a couple different types of kids where there's a transition from a minor guardianship to an adult guardianship. And I think this is important for all of us to understand. Um, because what I'm saying is in order for a child who's been a, had a minor guardianship, and this is in the real world, this is not where there's juvenile court involved at the moment, but in, in the real world, the child can be um, a minor. Once he turns 18, he can no longer um, have a legal guardian. But if he is, has some serious mental condition, and we'll talk what it takes for an adult guardianship later, such that he can't take care of himself or make decisions for his own safety or welfare, then he's going to need an adult guardianship too. And the important thing to understand is these are two separate things. So it, when the child turns 18 or before the child turns 18, an adult guardianship needs to, to be done with all those due process rights that any adult would have in that type of proceeding uh, has to be done before someone can be, become the guardian of this adult child. So an example <clears throat> would be you have a grandparent that has grand, um, custody, guardianship of a minor child. And let's say the parents consented, so they were good with the child staying with the grandparent. And basically it was because of the child had a serious mental condition that the parents couldn't care for. And, but it was so, such a serious me medical condition um, that as an adult, it was going to be there and remain, and this child was not going to be able to make decisions for safety and welfare. Then th that grandparent who had done the minor guardianship had gone in and, and had the parents consented and became the guardian of the child, has to go back to court before the child's 18 and do an adult guardianship and say, I still need to be guardian of this child and, and do that piece of it too. That's what it looks like there. The other transition from minor to adult guardianship involves kids under um, our older youth, for example, who are in residential placements with very serious um, diagnoses and will be in those residential placements for the rest of their lives because they, say, function at the level of a small child. Um, they are under juvenile court jurisdiction until the age of 21. So prior to the age of 21, that adult guardianship needs to be done. So that's the difference between 
just a real world example where a grandfather um, becomes the guard is the guardian while the child is a minor and then becomes the guardian while the child's an adult. Uh, once when you're in juvenile court involvement, then the child can remain under our jurisdiction until 21. So those guardianships will not be done then until prior to, right prior to the age of the child turning 21 if they're going to remain in one of our, our uh, DMH Medicaid waiver slots. That's a good example of that. Let's talk a, a little bit about CD contact with the family when you've got a minor guardianship. Um, I think it's really important uh, because we're talking about safety planning the child may be or may not be with the legal guardian, but you need to know that that legal guardian has the right to, to custody out there. So you're not only looking at the problem with what other relative or parent that the child happens to be placed with, um, did the guardian, did the legal guardian know about it? Because if these kind of kids come into care, you are looking at um, working reunification with the legal guardian as well as both of the parents. In most of these cases, um, what you see is if a child comes into, into care from a legal uh, guardian, is that they've had the child in their home for quite a period of time. Maybe the child's an older child. They're just having lots of disciplinary issues with them that may result in bad parenting, you know, abuse or neglect that bring the kids into care. So you've got a legal guardian that may be done and finished with having to deal with the, ch with the um, child at all. But you also have findings against both of those parents in the guardianship that they were unfit, unwilling, or judged unable to care for the child. So you have to overcome those and work with, work with all three to see how it shakes out in terms of who's going to get the child back. Um, and sometimes if the parents have been gone that long, they may not, they may not want to re-engage. But again, you're working reunification with all three because there's a legal guardian involved. Let's move on to the subject of adult guardianships. And I think this is important because when we're talking of uh, parents giving birth to children, if, if our parent giving birth to a child it has an adult guardianship, then there may be some serious ramifications about whether or not they can care for the child. Okay, we're on slide 60, and we're talking about guardianship for an adult. The legal term is incapacitated. And I didn't write the exact legal definition down here, but it went, what it amounts to is that their physical or mental condition is so serious that they can't make decisions for their own safety and well-being. Um, an example in one of the cases I worked with, uh, we had a father that was in a car accident that had a traumatic brain injury. He was in a coma, he was in a nursing home, and that was the way he was going to be the rest of his life. So seriously, ser um, Clearly, his condition was so serious that he could not make or communicate decisions for his own safety or well-being. Okay, sometimes there are limited guardianships. Well, the court has to decide that the parent is only, or the adult, is only partially incapacitated. So that means they may be able to make some decisions, but they can't make all of them, and they need a legal guardian to help make, some, make all of the rest of the decisions. So who can be a legal guardian? It can be the public administrator, but the court's preference is on a relative. Um, so it just depends upon whether or not you have a, a relative who will step up the plate and be the um, legal guardian. And I think even in our older youth, as, as they transition from a minor guardianship to an adult guardianship, we need to know, what, and they're in a DMH facility, we need to know whether or not uh, there's a relative that is willing to take um, the, and become the the legal guardian of the child or whether it will be the public administrator. Um, why is it important? Um, the term is incompetence when it comes to these adult guardianship. When you think of incompetence on a practical level, think of adults who have legal guardians. They can't make decisions to marry, they can't vote, they can't get a driver's license, they cannot enter into a con contract, and just think about it, they can't even consent or object to medical care. That decision is made by their legal guardian. So those are huge, important rights that an individual has to themselves. So if, if uh, there's a legal guardian 
for these type of adults, then you know they must have extremely serious problems where they can't make decisions for their own safety and well-being. So a person, the term incompetence is used for that. A per, and it's a person who has a guardian or conservator uh, or both, they shall be presumed incompetent. So if we have parents that have this adult guardianship, then they're presumed to not be able, because of the decisions the probate court has made, to be able to make decisions for themselves or their own welfare. And it only applies to the full guardianships uh, and or conservatorships. It doesn't apply to the limited ones. So, Why is it important? If a parent can't make decisions to take care of themselves for their own safety and welfare, welfare how are they going to do it for a child? So I think that's why it's so important, um, the safety issue. So that's something to remember, and I think this plays out throughout our cases uh, as if the kids come into care. We've got, I think, a small section on conservatorships, um, just again because of the terms and to make sure we're, we're clear on what everything means. <clears throat> and again, it's all about the money, which is why we've got the slide with the $20 bills on it. So if the minor child, again, has no living parents, um, then they need someone appointed as their uh, conservator in terms of their income and financial assets. And what kind of kids are we talking about? Well, again, think of the parents, the example I gave of the parents that were killed in the car accident where the child survives. There may be a legal action, action brought against the person who caused the accident that could result in um, quite a bit of money that would be held in trust by the courts for that particular child. So again, they would need a, a conservator to manage those assets. That's one example. For an adult, um, a conservatorship for an adult, the adult must be adjudged disabled. And disabled means they can't, uh, their physical or mental condition makes them unable to make decisions uh, that affect their ability to manage their finances. In a lot of respects, if, uh, you know, some of our, the cases we see, we have folks that are a little lower functioning that um, may be easy targets or prey for people to take advantage of them such that they would turn over their money to anybody that asked them on the street or in a heartbeat. And, and those are the kind of uh, conditions where maybe they just, where they have a conservator. That's an example. Um, a conserv there sometimes too we have limited conservatorships and maybe the person functions well enough that they've got a job and they can earn some income and they can manage a very small checking account but other income that they might have or other assets like that trust fund would need to be managed by someone else so that's how limited conservatorships so some other terms that come up that sometimes think people think involve guardianships or conservatorships are the terms Social Security payee, uh, durable powers of attorney, and those are terms that do not involve a guardianship or conservatorships. Um, Social Security can send Social Security benefits on a person to their payee if, if there's someone else that's receiving the money for them. Durable powers of attorney are things that are done in an attorney's office that again operate outside of a guardianship or a probate court in terms of what can be done. And then sometimes we have family members who informally just manage or care for the person and care for their assets, and we see that quite a bit. Our last uh, section that involves um, child custody deals with child custody through a power of attorney. So this one we only have a few points on, um, but I think we see this again a lot out in the field when um, we're going out on calls, we're doing investigations, assessments, and providing services. So the statute specifically allows a parent of a minor child, if they properly execute a power of attorney, to delegate to another individual for up to one year any power regarding um, custody of the child, except they can't agree to marry an underage child and they can't consent to the child's adoption. So the most important piece is it's only good for a year. So an example would be a parent takes a vacation in Europe and leaves a power of attorney that clearly grants the caretaker authority to make all the decisions necessary for the child's care and custody for the period of time they're on vacation in Europe. That makes sense. I know as a grandparent, um, we have 
grandkids in another part of the state and when we get them for four or five days, we generally get a document that is, says we have the right to make medical decisions for the child, uh, the kids for the two weeks or two days that they're with us and provides all the insurance information, names and dates of birth of the child and then it's signed and notarized and that's, that's what our family members provide us. So that's a, an exception of a pa power of attorney and it's dated. Again, in order, since you know it's only good for one year, you have to remember there's got to be a date on it somewhere for it to be good at all. Another example, a child lives with a single mom. Dad is on the birth certificate but lives 30 miles away and has little contact with mom or the child. So mom gives the, gran the maternal grandparents a power of attorney to make any and all decisions for the child, for the care and custody of the child for the three months that she's working out of state. Well, dad gets a whiff of this is what's going on and decides he wants the child. So he comes to grandma's house and takes the child back to his house and keeps the child. Now, can that happen when there's a power of attorney in place? Well, just remember, a parent's right to custody is going to trump a power of attorney, unless there's some type of order that says no custody to that particular parent. But sometimes we see that. So just be aware that that's, that's out there. The power of attorney is, is good as long as the other parent doesn't want the child. They've got to be legally entitled to the child, but unless they don't want the child. Um, the best example I can think of is, you know, if his name's on the birth certificate, then for sure he's a dad. If there's custody orders and things like that in place, then obviously he's a dad and would be entitled to that custody. So tips about <clears throat> these, these um, power of attorneys. They only apply to minor kids, kids under the age of 18. So it's, it's got to be signed. Um, it's got to be delegated to another individual. It's only good for up, up to one year, and it doesn't apply to marriage or adoptions. So what are the tips if you're in, a, in the family home and they're talking about having a power of attorney? And believe me, as, as a JO attorney for eight years, there were a number of these that came across my desk when we were involved in, in problems and cases. <clears throat> I think, first of all, you ask to see the power of attorney and read it. You look to see if the parent signed it. You look to see if it's dated. Is the document clear about what type of authority is granted? Is the document clear about the period of time it's effective? And again, if there's no time period given, then you calculate one date from the, the signature date. So uh, you just have to look at these. And again, if there's problems with this kind of information, you need to check with your local DLS attorneys on um, how that is handled. The very last section we have is just a slide on child support enforcement because child support enforcement um, can determine somebody to be a dad and can order him to pay support, order him to pay medical. But child support enforcement orders are not for custody or visitation. They have nothing to do with that. So they're only determining paternity and support. They cannot do non-paternity determinations. They're only in the business of finding and making men dads. But you have to go to court to get, a, um, to get an order for custody. So I think today we've, we've looked at the laws on custody between parents and third-party custodians. Um, we've looked at orders of, uh, from paternity cases and what type of custody can be granted there. We've looked at domestic violence cases and what child and, and adult orders of protection provide for custody orders for kids. Um, then towards the end, we hit the uh, guardianships for adults and minors, and we hit the uh, powers of attorneys, and finally child support enforcement. So hopefully this has been a good survey for you in terms of things you need to think about um, when you're out in the field working with families and information that you wanna learn from them. Thank you very much.